Oh, I have, I have the problem again because I'm too short and uh, the mic is too high and I don't have a handheld mic today. So I keep jumping um, and hiding behind this stand. Okay, um, so we, uh, we are going to start the lightning talk. So who wasn't here yesterday for the lightning talk? Oh, there are some people. Okay, I need to explain the rules again. So um, the lightning talk rules are if you uh, sign up, uh, on the on the paper uh, this morning, then um, you can uh, get ready and then maybe sit next to the stage and then because you will come one by one on the stage and we want to get you up and running as soon as possible. So you will have five minutes to uh, for the lightning talk if you're promoting a conference. I don't think we have today, but uh, yeah, you only got two minutes. And then when the time is almost up, I will do this and everybody need to do the same thing to annoy the speakers or let them know that we are almost done. Please practice. Yes, that's, that's very annoying. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, that's good. That's good. I mean, it's good. So uh, when the time is up, please give the speaker a big applause. And remember, there's only positive noises are allowed. So please don't boo people. That's not very nice in a super nice um, conference. So OK, we shall have our first. Oh, I have a mic. I have a mic. You have a mic. Let me crown you. Let's get, let's get some. Oh, my god. I'm not good at this. Can I do what you did on the first day? Yeah. Yeah, I would just hold it. Uh, okay. Or. Hold this for you. Okay. Actually, actually, I'm I'm better. Do it myself. Okay. Cool. So, um, yeah. So uh, when the time is up, please give a round of applause. Shall we practice now and give a round of applause? Thank you. Oh, wow, wow, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so while our first speaker is setting up. Um, can I have, uh, do you want to show your pew pew? Sorry, what's your name? You want to show your, your pew pew device? I have some minutes before the first speaker is setting up. Do you want to show it? Oh, we don't have the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe you set up and then like if the, the time between the first speaker and the second. Is it? Okay. That works. Yes. <laughs> I can move the computer if you need the camera. Yes, okay, are you, are you guys okay? Technical, technical people are working okay. That's very good. That's very good. Okay, so let me t talk about my uh, Windows 7 jokes, which I want to talk about yesterday and I forgot. So uh, last year, who were here and remember my Windows 7 lightning talk? No one? Some people? Oh, really? <laughs> you still remember? So yeah, I... Last year, it's actually my first live stream talk, and then I gave a talk about, like, uh, we are not very inclusive, including people who use Windows 7. And then, um, so uh, basically, um, I'm whining, you know, like, about, oh, it's difficult to use Windows 7. And then the story is, by the time I give my first live stream talk, I feel so great, and I go back to my seat. Somebody tapped on my shoulder, and then my face turned white, because the person behind me and tapped my shoulder is, um, okay, by the time, at that time, I didn't know who he is, and he showed me his name tag, and actually, I, did, I don't even recognize his name, but his name tag said Microsoft. So I was like, oh, God, like, is this a very important person in Microsoft? And I just jeopardized my, my, my opportunity to work for Microsoft. It's like, oh, my God, I ruined my career. So, um, so actually, yeah, that's Steve. Um, you, you may guess who he is, and then uh, since then, we've become friends. Um, so this is how I met him, which is very funny. Um, oh, and do you like my shirt? This shirt uh, is from Namibia. So uh, yeah, again, yay, Namibia! Yeah. Are we still setting up, like, it, is, it, is it Windows 7, that's why it's so slow? <laughs> no, it's a Mac, okay. No. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, this is from Namibia, and um, it's, it's uh, super cool, because, oh, we're, are we ready? We okay? Yes, no, no, not yet, okay. So, uh, yeah, like, uh, PyCon Namibia, I highly recommend it, because uh, Africans actually very fashionable. <laughs> And you can see, yay, we are set up. Can we just use that cam? Okay. Oh, we have an Inception camera again. Okay, so, okay, you only have one minute to, to, to present it, please. Hello, I'm Peter. Uh, you can't really see anything. Uh, so my game, I made a very simple game where you avoid falling blocks, which you can't really see. Uh, anyway, yeah, there, there we go. So I don't know if I can lose. 
there, I can lose. Uh, I thought it would be nice to control this game by tilting the device, but the accelerometer I have isn't really working, so I need to iterate on that and probably get better hardware. But it's really fun to play these. Uh, try, to, try to make a simple game. It's really rewarding and, uh, uh, and nice to you know, play a game you, you actually created on real hardware. Thank you so much. Thank you. Woo! OK, now, now let's our first speaker start setting up. Are, are you setting up or? I'm right? set up. Yes, cool. Let's start. Let's give a round of applause for our first speaker. Yes, so I want to talk about uh, Naval Arm, a project I've been working on the last five years. So uh, it's installed in Christiania. It's a part of Denmark. We exploded it 45 years ago. It looked like this. We still have it. We purchased it uh, three years ago. So it surrounds the whole area you see up there. We own the place and we own the infrastructure. So it gets quite cold in Christiania in the winter and people used to fire off in their furnaces with uh, coal and all kind of shit. So there would be smog over the city and we tried to get them to use gas, but they wouldn't pay and old squatters don't pay bills. So we created uh, 25 years ago, of course not me, uh, this guy, he created uh, an idea about trying to do distributed production centers basically putting a central heating in the ground. And uh, we are doing it ad hoc, so when we have a need for a new production center, we create it and then we connect a few houses and then came the problem about billing them because we knew that they don't pay bills. So what to do? Uh, we went to their houses, they had they had some meters, and we purchased some more recycled meters of the black market in Denmark. And those meters, they are they're not to be sold uh, secondhand, uh, but we, we got them anyway. They are, they are proprietary, so you can't, you can't get to know what they are measuring. You need to have a key. So we spent the winter, really cold, because we didn't build the system yet. So we spent the winter reverse engineering all the protocols, and then we went to the company and said, so, uh, so we, have, we have created a device now that is uh, able to talk to your devices. And uh, it's this small ESP8266 uh, based solution there. And you have a similar solution that you take uh, 2,000 euros for, and we've created this for 150 kroner, which is about 14 euros. And they were, they were really angry at us. <laughs> so, yeah, no more communication with them, I guess. Uh, the fun thing about this is that you're able to connect a valve to it, so we created a prepaid solution. You have your phone, go into your phone, you use a, a Danish payment system, you send off a few euros, the valve opens and you consume your heating. Of course, you can regulate it with your radi radiators, but the valve will turn off after your heating has been consumed. So that is pretty neat for people that don't like bills. Yes. And everything is open source. So we did all the designs for the furnaces based on old oil burners. Everything is released. Uh, even the reverse engineered protocols. Uh, we didn't sign no NDA. Uh, we, but we have the NDA at home, unsigned. <laughs> and then, uh, so we have some firmware, mostly C, and a lot of Perl. Of course, it's not me that is writing Perl, then I wouldn't be here. It's my friend. He hates Python. I don't. But uh, yeah. So a uh, lot, of, lot of code there. So I don't know if I can get this to work, but uh, one of the few Python projects I made in, the, in this uh, kind of context is to so sonic sonify all the data. Uh, because. It w I thought it would be pretty nice to have like a, a sonic overview of the whole heating infrastructure with all its 400 users and every time they would turn on their radiator I would get another sound and that could be really fun. Uh, it sounds like uh, some avant-garde jazz, I, I don't know if I can get it to work here. 
Um, probably not. This is the live system. This is the sound of Christiania right now. It's very avant-garde. Yeah. So uh, that's about it. We are very much looking for people to come and visit us. We have a house. You can stay for free. You can avoid Pearl. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> All right, raise yourselves. This is going to be a technical one. Um, so try to keep the attention. This is going to be quite fast, but really, really useful if you, if you like functional programming, which you should. So um, runs under the title, multi-threading is easy if you write functional Python. Writing a pure function is not all nearly elegant, fast, and makes your code beautiful. It also comes with really nice benefits for parallelism slash multi-threading. So I made this really, really bad example because I'm really bad at making examples. But we just want to try and greet a couple of people. I use this module faker to, um, to just generate a couple of names. And a really simple greet function that all that it does is waits a second so I can show off the parallelism and otherwise returns a greeting. So, hey everyone, welcome here. Great. So, now we want to greet everyone and a naive implementation of that can get really, really ugly. This is what you would do as a beginner and it works, it's fine, but there's way more elegant ways of doing this in Python than to start with an empty output, start a loop, in the loop, have an if condition that checks for several things, get the greeting, concatenate it, changing a variable in place all the time, and then eventually printing it. This is really not elegant. So what do we do instead? We use filter and map. So first we take that list of names, and I just took some arbitrary constraints here. Names starting with E, ending with S, which coincidentally is uh, what happens with my first name. Um, you filter them with a lambda function. You map them over the greet function that we already had earlier. Um, and you join the output together. Again, no special cases because there is nice functionality in Python readily available to make this nice and functional. So I got completely rid of the loop, and I can pass this to Python, which already gives me a couple of under the hood um, sort of optimizations because even if it looks like I'm doing a filter and then a map first, you might think, oh, wait, then it does two loops through my data. No, it doesn't. These are lazily evaluated functions. So it's, in fact, at least as fast as your manual loop. So, um, and that makes it really, really easy to parallelize because um, all I have in my map here is that greet function. So I really just take in a name, spit out a, a greeting, and that can run on any machine, on any thread. It doesn't need a lot of context, which is what you always should aim for. Write functions that are repeatable, that are simple. Input plus function equals output. No side effects as long as you can avoid it. And then all I'm doing is I'm installing this Python PMAP library, importing it, and importantly, I'm replacing the call to map with pmap, which magically parallelizes us now. Let's ha have a quick look back to here. This, um, is way too fast. Uh, yeah, I only got one example. That's the problem with random data. Never do a demo with random data. Uh, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. If you're doing this parallel, I think by default it takes the number of cores you have on your machine. So this is in theory four times as fast than before just because I put a P in front of the map. 
Um, and that is really the core of the talk, because I have one more minute. I'm just going to spread the word for Coconut, which is a really, really great extension to Python. Layers on top of it, compiles to Python, and then uh, executes that. And you can install that, load it into Jupyter, for example, and get this really funky functional syntax here, where you take inputs and pipe them or thread them, whatever your choice of preferred choice of word is, pipe them through sort of functions. Uh, the dollar sign makes it a curried function with already some value set. You can uh, use question marks. You can use lambdas with arrow syntax, and there's a lot more there. But essentially, I'm piping the input through a filter that tosses out anyone not starting with E, through a second filter, anyone not ending in an S, maps that over the greet function, joins it all together, and prints it um, in a very, very concise way. And when you get a bit into the syntax, it's very, very readable and very elegant. Thank you. I think, I think, um, thank you so much, because like, I have a volunteer here like, showing the clock, so I think that's why every speaker is like, perfectly on time, which is perfect. Uh, do you need a hand? OK. Yep. So um, yeah, uh, is it? Oh, it's already running. Oh, I have not, nothing to say between, because it's so smooth. OK, let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, my name is Tomoko, and my Twitter ID is KomoFR. I'm from Japan, and it took 14 hours to come here. Uh, this is my first Europython, and I'm really enjoying. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I talk how I analyzed PEPs with Network X. As you know, uh, PEPs are very important documents, but there are so many. So beginners uh, don't know what, uh, which one to read first, which PEP is important, and what topics do PEPs cover. So I wanted something like a map to read PEPs. My idea is to use citation relationship. In academia, important papers are often cited from other papers. Uh, and there are also citation relationships among PEPs. For example, PEP 8 refers to PEP 20. And uh, PEP 8 and 257 also refers to each other. So I thought network analysis might be useful to understand the PEPs. Network analysis is a, oh sorry, <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> network analysis is a method to analyze relationship among elements, and in Python, network X makes it easy to get started. Uh, this is a PEP citation network drawn by network X. The colors show status such as accepted, rejected and others. And uh, the size shows number of other PEPs citing that PEP. Uh, this large red node is the PEP most cited from other PEPs. OK, uh, here is a quiz. Uh, <laughs> which PEP is most cited from other PEPs? A, PEP 1. B, PEP 8. C, PEP 302. <laughs> Please raise your hand, okay. <laughs> uh, the A, PEP 1, PEP purpose and guidelines. Oh, oh, <laughs> thank you. Next, B, PEP 8, um, style guide for <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> everyone's love this. <laughs> uh, next, C, PEP 302, you import folks. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the answer is PEP8, style guide for Python code. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> uh, PEP8 is most, uh, PEP8 is cited from 21 other PEPs. And the second place is new import hooks. And, but PEP484 type hints is the same. Uh, by the way, PEP1 was the seventh. Okay, 
uh, next, we can find many interesting things from this network. For example, this small island is the pep about the switch statement. These were replaced over 10 years ago, and these are isolated from other PEPs. And uh, next, let's look at this area. Uh, in this area, there are many 8,000 series PEPs. These PEPs are about the new gov governance of the Python language, and these were created last year. And these are connected to other PEPs via PEP1 and 572. Okay, this area seems to be a group about new governance. Then, how about other area? Let's do clustering. Network X data can be clustered using Python Ruben package. Let's try. Uh, these are some of the results. The top area seems to be a group for package. These PEP titles include many words such as package, wheel, and PyPI. And this is the area for processes and document formatting. Uh, PEP 8003, uh, PEP 1, 12, 257, and more PEPs. Uh, this map is very exciting, so I'm creating an interactive web page with Network X and Bokeh. And if you are interested in this talk, please check my this talk. And in Japan, PyCon JP will be held in <laughs> September. <laughs> I'm looking for a senior day. Okay, so um, we have our next speaker coming, and then, yes, we are ready to go. Big round of applause. Hey, so I'm Robin, and I will tell you how you can let monkeys annotate your Python. So what kind of annotations am I talking about? Of course, type annotations, PEP 484. Um, so type annotations, uh, 30 second summary, Python is a dynamically typed language, but sometimes um, it's nice to have uh, type information. So we have those optional type hints, and they're not checked at runtime most of the time, um, but you can stack them, uh, check them before runtime. And um, they're useful for documentation, so I think most big projects should have them. Um, and this is the, the minimal example of type hints um, for function signatures. All right, so how do you start using type hints? Actually, there was a talk yesterday by Vita that get into a lot of depth how to actually do this and best practices, so I refer, uh, refer to that. Um, what I would suggest is incrementally add types, um, start with one sub-module, start adding stuff, focus on public interfaces that are actually like, useful to other libraries using your code, um, and consider adding new types, so using this uh, new type feature um, to have like, the explicit names for semantics. So how do you actually add types? I mean, if you have this huge code base of Python code, do you want to go through all of it and manually type stuff? It's really annoying, and especially like the few files, your developers will stop doing that. Um, so what you can do is automate that. And this is where monkey type comes in. Monkey type is a tool um, published by Instagram. And what it does is you can run your code um, with monkey type, and it um, looks at all the variables and their types at runtime, and writes it to a database. And afterwards, you can generate type notations from that. So the, the first use case for that, and the one that we actually used in our project, um, was we have very excellent test coverage, integration, integration test coverage um, of our code. So we can just run this integration test suite with monkey type, and it writes on all the types it sees. And uh, we can fill in the type notation in the code um, from that. The other thing that um, one could do if you don't have as good a test coverage is actually run like in a dev setup or staging setup or even production <laughs> with monkey type and uh, record the actual types you see in reality. And uh, some of the things, so monkey type doesn't add perfect types, so you manually have to go over them and check them, but like 80% of the work is done. So for example, it, if it sees none a lot or it doesn't see none, but it should be there, you probably have to, to correct for that with this, this optional annotation. 
and depending what kind of tests you use to generate your types, so don't use unit tests that use mocks because then your types that are in the code are the mock types, not the real types. And so be, be careful of that. I want to give you like a 30 second uh, demo of how this works. So this is uh, my code, no type annotations. I have a multiplication function and a test for that. And what I can do now is um, I do monkey type run. And what I do is I, I run pytest. Um, I just run pytest on this file and have monkey type run around it. So my tests are green, that's good. <laughs> and then there is a, a monkey type apply. And I give it a module name. And what it now did, I'm looking at the diff, it just added the types it saw. So I, my test hands in two ints, um, and the function returns an int. So it's adding uh, to my function that both variables are type int and returns an int. And it can also do more, more complex types, so that's union types and all that, that stuff, if you like. All right, so try out monkey type. It's very useful if you want to add types to your project. Thank you. We will have one more. We'll have one more lightning talk. Then we'll um, have a lucky draw again. So make sure that you stay because if you are not in the room, then I'm afraid you can't win the prize. And if you want to go to the toilet, that's too bad. So yeah. Uh, are you ready? Are you ready? Uh, oh. Same computer. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. There's a. Uh, okay. okay. Bravo. Hi, um, so uh, my name is Neo Vete and I come from Copenhagen. Um, my background is in astrophysics and while I was working at the university I really got into public outreach and in Copenhagen every year we have this uh, thing called the Culture Night where all the universities and museums for a whole evening open their doors and the general public come and have a look. Um, so you can see some, uh, kind of get the idea from the pictures below there. Um, so my research was mainly into uh, computational fluid dynamics and I was thinking, okay, how can I make this interesting for young kids and uh, teenagers? And I wanted to have something that was fun, but also that there was still an element of physics in it. Um, so this is what I came up with. Okay, so um, this is running uh, in the browser, and uh, what I can do is if I click to the mouse, I'll be injecting energy just like supernova explosions, and it's actually solving the fluid equations in real time on your browser. Um, that's why, it, depending on the computer, it can work a bit better, but the, you have to keep the resolution quite crappy for it to work. Um, I can change the color map because, well, let's face it, nobody likes jet. Um, you can, if you don't like space invaders, you can blow them up. <laughs> uh, you can also blow up the Death Star if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, that's it, but I guess it's kind of I think uh, public outreach is really important because you're targeting not like university students, but you're going even younger and to get the passion into about science and computing into these very young children, I think is really important. Thank you. Wow, this is, this is Art, I think this is like uh, comparable to like the keynote speakers showing that uh, art. I think you should go to Seoul and show this. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, we will have the lucky draw now, yay! <laughs> so, uh, super, uh, super like AI powered, machine learning, you know, powered um, algorithm to uh, pick the winner. So um, I'll let okay. Alex do it. So this is, these are the prices. Let's see whether we can narrow it down a little bit better than yesterday. <laughs> I did not improve anything. Oh. <laughs> Why? Oh, no, it doesn't like it. Oh, it doesn't show? No, yeah. it should show. OK, OK. Oh, here we go. OK. So we have, welcome back, Pi Cassandra. Pi Cassandra, give us a question. Stand up. If you have submitted a talk to Europython 2019 only, 
Okay. Ooh, speakers. Speakers. They deserve it. They deserve it. Come on. Yeah. Keep standing. If you the day of your birth, so the day, so the well, uh, is odd. How many people left? It's sometimes really hard to see from here. There's so many in the lights. So, okay. So, okay. Keep standing if you travel. Oh, okay, that's a good question. Keep standing if you traveled more than approximately 8,300 kilometers. I Anyone no left standing? I have no idea. Okay. How then, far okay. To um, stand up again. Who just look, we skip this part now? So, if you has been, yeah. We reset to the last question. This is a bad one. Let's see it. So keep standing if your first name contains upper or lower case. Oh, come on. <laughs> X? If you're still standing, then like. I'm okay, keep I'm standing, keep standing, keep standing. <laughs> keep standing. So. Keep standing if your birthday contains the number nine. Come on, it's like everybody. But. I have improved. Keep standing. If uh, we do this again, five. The birthday with a five. That's okay. Who's standing? Can you raise your hands? One, two, I think, three. I four, think I'm four, qualified as well. Four, five. Oh my, that's too many. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, okay. So let's repeat the question. <laughs> Actually, we was uh, expecting the decision to be much faster. Six. You're also oh. a six in your birthday? Oh, no, no. Nobody me. left? Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, here. We have a winner. Oh, great. Now, it's sometimes really hard to see. There's a lot of light here. So uh, today we simplify and uh, give free choice. So, OK. OK. Which may have choices from all these arriving ones. It's like a library. <laughs> So okay. what are we gonna do for this? Another round. Another oh, okay. Let's try okay. to can we, like can two, we speed four, up? Can we speed six, up? Okay. Six people. We standing. need six people. Come we need on. six people, and we ask Cassandra the next question. Let me rerun this notebook a bit. Do better, Cassandra, please. <laughs> the Cassandra one, actually. I thought it was just like a really decision tree, really narrowing down everything to like one person. Um, Starting or really fast. Um, oh, it runs. No, okay. no, I just want here. This oh. is what I'm looking for. So uh, restart. Import the questions. Stand up if this is not your first year. Ooh, recurring uh, customers. Too many people Ooh. again. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. Stand up if the, keep standing if the day of your birth is odd. Ooh. It's 50%. <laughs> keep standing if you traveled more than 50. Okay, let's skip that. That's, or That's is anyone, has anyone traveled more than 50,000 kilometers? Oh, okay. That's okay. Gabe, keep standing if your first name contains upper or lower case, the letter H. Ah, that looks promising. Yeah, let's stop here. Who, who, how many people have we? Raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, we have too many books, sorry. Uh, we don't have enough books for you. So uh, keep standing if your birthday has uh, number two. Okay. That looks very good. It looks so promising. How many people are left? One, two, three, four, five, think, six. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Okay. I think we the have books, more than six. The books, the books are distributed now at FIFO, but you can maybe <laughs> trade the books. I want to speed up the process a bit. So. Come, come up here first. Come up here first. Come up here first. Oh yeah, you have to fight. You have to be, I want this, I want this, no. Uh, uh. Yeah, okay. Oh, Maybe we have another round of questions for these people. Yeah, sure. Uh, we travel more than uh, one <laughs> We travel the furthest. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. Ask, ask one more questions. One more question. Yes. But Oh, come on. This will totally. But now it's very exciting. So like, I, I come here, I need the book. If your birthday has uh, number three in it, Somebody there? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so you it's can your first now, And then the others, please wait. Okay, let's keep. Then let's keep, take. Keep, 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 keep. Okay. Three, two. Yeah, okay. Then you take two books. We now make the uh, first. Wait. Let's speed okay. it up. Okay, so then again. So oh, the, the wait, others, wait, wait, please. Wait, wait, wait. We have, we have the, one, two, three. Wait. Oh, okay. Is it, is it good? Okay. Okay. okay it's so good. Okay. We're really good at counting, uh, Chuck, okay, are yeah. we? 
I can't count. Oh my God. All right. I, tell my teacher. Jesus. So thanks for Riley for giving us these books for Thank you roughly. so much. Oh, I think you need to learn deep learning. That's yours. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but yeah. No. <laughs> okay, so um, are we all set for the next speaker very soon? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, is it Binder again? Is it the right one? Okay, I think so, yeah. Okay, round of applause. Yay, woo! Hi, my name is Tim, and I really like to go to tutorials and workshops and spend half the time setting up software. Who of you would join me for that? Okay, so for all the others, we built uh, some software called Binder. And uh, what it does is it's a website. You type in the link to a Git repository, and then we build a Docker container for you and connect you to it. And all you need to have working in your workshop is a laptop or tablet with a browser and internet. And, you know, so I will tell you a little bit more about uh, Binder. You have a GitHub repository in this case that contains fantastic material for your workshop, and you want to start it uh, on Binder. And what you do is you go to mybinder.org and you type in the name of the repository. So in this, in, in this case, it's binder example slash requirements, and you click launch. And what happens, if you're lucky, is there's a big orange bar saying already built and launching. And these are the most painful 20 seconds of giving live demos about binder. Because if we're lucky, it takes around 15 seconds for it to spin up, and I have to fill 15 seconds. If we're unlucky, because lots and lots of other people at SciPy, for example, are using it to uh, join a workshop and there's 60 people starting other binders. It can take a minute or longer and then you're really using your time for your lightning talk productively. But generally, it is very quick like this. And what you get is, if you're a fan of Jupyter, a very well-known interface and you can now click on the notebook And you can start running it, editing it, and figuring stuff out about uh, what you actually want to do in your workshop instead of installing software. So how does it work? What does it do? Uh, this is a repository I just edited before the talk to let you see what happens when um, it's actually building. So you see lots of repos that have these fancy badges. And they will take you directly there. And ah, well, somebody already tried out that repo in the meantime. So what you see now is not a whole bunch of pip install commands scrolling by, but uh, the same thing we had before. We have lots of examples. So for example, if requirements.txt is not your uh, you know, favorite way of installing stuff, but you prefer to use conda packages, if you put a environment.yaml in your repo, we will figure out that probably we should install all the stuff in it for you. Uh, if, and this has to be a secret amongst us, you use R, we've got you covered too. So in this case, uh, you put a file called install.r in your repository and it contains all the commands to set up the packages that uh, your friends who use R need, because I'm sure you don't want to admit to using R. And the cool thing here is if you start it and the demo gods are with us, then you don't see a Jupyter Notebook interface because if you use R, you like using R Studio. And that's a nice thing about Binder is you can have notebooks or you can use R Studio or VS Code or lots of other things. Basically, any interface that is a web page works. So eventually here, RStudio will load. There you go. I can't show you around this because I don't know how to use it. Um, <laughs> um, if you want to do really complicated stuff, then you can write a Docker file by hand if that's you know, like how you like spending your time. And then you're free to do whatever you want. 
Uh, we have an example of what the minimal Docker file looks like. And there's a GitHub repo or organization called Binder Examples. It contains lots and lots of examples. So uh, Nix is a package manager. Uh, we have examples of how to pull in data, pip files, requirements, bokeh um, examples, LaTeX, you know, if you like using LaTeX. Uh, the list continues and continues and continues. So the nice thing is this is open source software that you can contribute to, and it's open infrastructure. We also uh, run the service, and we need your help, or we'd appreciate your help uh, to run it. So see you on the internet. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, I believe this is a conference promotion, so you have two minutes, I'm afraid. So, the, but the picture looks really, really, really good already. I think, I think it says a lot of words already. Not only the picture looks good, <laughs> although the conference. I would like to en uh, invite you to your SciPy. Who of you has been at your SciPy before? Just a few people, you missed something. Therefore, you should go to your SciPy. Your SciPy will be in Bilbao in Spain. It's a very nice place, easy to get there. Uh, your SciPy will be the first week of September. Uh, and at this time, we do have a lot of things, and one of them is a social event. So you should try to pinch those there. If you, if maybe you know what pinchos are. Do, do you see them? There's a lot of them, a lot of variety, and you should not miss them. That's your opportunity to try pinchos. Uh, Bilbao is a place for, uh, where your Python 2015 and 16 happened, so you might know Bilbao already. Uh, we have a lot of talks, so we have very nice keynotes, so if you want to know something about black holes, there's a keynote about really even beyond rocket science, black holes. Uh, then we have a lot of talks. The conference is organized as follows. We have two days of training, two days of talks, and one day of sprints. So there's a lot of famous names, as you can see here from the scientific community, with very interesting topics and very high quality talks. Uh, the trainings are two tracks, a beginner's track and advanced track, so that will be something for everybody. And uh, we also do have a special track for maintainers of open source packages, maintainers discussion, so if you maintain a package, you can meet with like-minded uh, people and talk about how to do this. Um, this, the call for sponsors is still open, so if you would like to sponsor the conference, please go to this link. Um, more infos you can find on our website, herosci.org, and we're also on Twitter. And see you in Bilbao. Um, so yeah, I, I travel a lot, and um, uh, also a fun fact, I'm from Hong Kong. I was born in Hong Kong before 1997, which gave me something very, very special. Um, I, have a, I have a passport, uh, well, I'm telling you like, uh, something about my, uh, you know, uh, okay, GDPR doesn't exist, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I have a British National Overseas Passport, and this passport is super funny because um, my friend have the same passport, and also she's is similar to me, you know, like we, we work in the UK, and for, for us, like people who was born in Hong Kong and only have this like British national overseas passport, then we have to get a, a visa to work in the UK. So what happened is like, in my passport, a, like it looks exactly like a British passport, but inside I have a British visa. So, uh, uh, some people know it's like kind of, it's, it's funny, right? And then. This kind of sometimes gives us problem when we travel abroad. Uh, for example, like uh, I said, I have been to Nam Namibia, and then I almost missed my flight from Johannesburg back to London because the flight attendant was like, "Well, is there a real passport? Why you have a British visa in your British passport? Like, um, what's happening?" And I was like, "Don't question me. Like, I, I, I can enter the UK. They will, they will question me. Like, please let me board a plane. And I'm the only one on the ground, and everybody was on the plane. I was like, "Oh no!" So um, yeah, but. At the end, I go back to London safely and on time, which is very good. Um, but my friend is not that lucky. She went, uh, she tried to go to um, Kazakhstan for holiday. She, uh, her flight was, you know, she fly to Belarus and then change the flight and go to Kazakhstan, right? So it's a long journey. And by the time she reached uh, Kazakhstan, and then, okay, oh, I will tell you later.
Hello, thank you for coming. Lightning talks are so important because there's so much great software out there and we just don't know about it. For example, Binder, I didn't really know about it. And the problem is, um, and the best thing is, if it's a bad lightning talk, it's over in five minutes. Um, in PyCon USA, they had four hours of lightning talks. You don't want to sit through all of those. So here we have the 12 best ones. Um, and you don't even have to take an hour to watch through them. Um, this is at pythonlinks.info because you can just scan the brief description and you can see exactly what the lightning talk is about and whether it's of interest to you or not. Okay, this is fine for just PyCon USA, but what happens when we get to more videos? What happens when we get to, say, a thousand videos? So at pythonlinks.info, before I started doing the lightning talks, I was indexing Python videos. Um, here we have over a thousand of the best Python videos. If you go to YouTube or Twitter, you get an infinite list. But a basic principle in human factors is there should be no more than about seven items in a category. So here, um, we have a category called data science, uh, machine learning, parallelism, multi-threading, multi-processing, people and communities, uh, Python skills development. A woman at PyCon USA said, I'd like to learn a new Python skill. So I said, great, just go to YouTube look up the skill you want to learn, and watch the video. And she says, I don't know what the skills are. So I said, what you need is a discovery engine. Come to pythonlinks.info, and one-seventh of the videos are on skills. Beginner, intermediate, advanced, design, testing, monitoring. You can see what skill you want to learn, and you can watch the videos. So it's structured as a tree. Um, here we're going to jump down into the tree. And in the upper left, you can see where you are in the tree. So taxonomy, tree of life, is very important for organizing. If you look in the upper left, you can click, but I don't know about the network. Here you can see the entire tree, and if you have a desktop, you can hover over it and it'll zoom in. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, this is all built on top of the forest wiki. Um, I'm, they were kind enough to give me a poster session on the forest wiki. I invite you to come and, and talk, talk about it. Um, the Forest Wiki allows you to develop and run Python in the browser. Uh, thanks, a big shout out to Transcript, which allows you to take um, Python and transpiles it to JavaScript. And even more important is Pyodide, which um, is C Python compiled to WebAssembly and running in the browser. It's from Mozilla, it's really great. Um, they have 37 data science libraries which, have, which run in the browser. And pure Python will also run with a pip install. Um, you can click on contact, um, pythonlinks.info, you can click on contact, you can go to my website. And also in my few minutes remaining, I will mention, um, in Gdańsk in October of this year is the PyCode conference, um, probably a lot less expensive than Basel. Um, we invite you to come and call for papers is open till um, 17th of this month. Thank you very much. Let me quickly finish my story. So um, yeah, like uh, she arrived Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan is like is a country that you know most people speak uh, Russian. So um, of course at the immigration people only speak Russian, and I will tell you later what happened. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, quick round of applause. <laughs> yeah. So hi. Um, it was at EuroPython 2016 uh, that I flew the last time. And since then, I've been trying to avoid flying. Why? Um, because it, it's, it's an extremely elite way of uh, being transported. 90% of the world population will never have the chance in their life to uh, set a foot in a, in a plane. And even only 3% of the world population are regular flyers. So um, I decided myself to uh, no longer be uh, part of that group, which I was, obviously, a uh, group of um, regular flyers, which is an elite group. I uh, wanted to be part of a different uh, elite group that changes the world with software and doesn't burn it with emissions, personal uh, decision. Um, one important thing to note here, uh, if you say something like this, also make sure that your internet servers actually run on renewable energy, otherwise you're far from it. 
So at Europass in 2017, I was actually very lucky. It was pretty much around the corner, it was in Italy. Um, but I didn't have time to go there anyway, so no flying for me. Uh, Europython 2018 was in Edinburgh, and I managed to go there without flying. Uh, so in case you don't know, Edinburgh is up there. That's the continent, right? British islands over there. And uh, which you probably don't know, I live down there. So uh, I looked that up in the uh, train travel uh, uh, schedule. And uh, the Deutsche Bahn said, uh, told me that uh, going from München to Edinburgh takes about 15 hours straight, which is pretty okay. I mean, only three changes along the way. So that's totally doable in one day, right? I didn't. <laughs> so that's the difference between getting there, which is totally what flying is all about, right? You get there um, versus traveling. So I decided to travel there. Um, and I took a route, which is um, still kind of, kind of the obvious route you would take there, um, from München to Paris, uh, to London, and up to Edinburgh, but with a stop in Lille <laughs> along the way. So uh, this is where I would arrive normally, Gare l'Est, in Paris, uh, first stop after München. Uh, but you don't get out uh, Gare l'Est at that front. What you see is um, this. Right? Um, because that's how you exit Gare Less normally when you go to Gare du Nord, which is just around the corner. So for those who have never been to Paris, this is what Paris looks like when you switch. <laughs> that's, uh, you go up the stairs, and then on the left in the end, and there's Gare du Nord, and that's where my journey continued. This is Gare du Nord. Not, mentioning, not worth mentioning that much. Um, and then I came to Lille. Um, this is a, a city that I really like. It's a beautiful city in the north of France. If you ever have a chance to get there, it's wonderful. Just give it a try. You go there for a weekend if you want. Don't fly there. Go there by train. <laughs> um, why is it cool? Well, it's, it's right in the center between um, Brussels, Paris, and London. So there's direct train con connection to each of them. It's like one hour to Paris, two hours to London, half an hour to, to uh, Brussels. So if you ever have to go to any of these three cities and need a night stay in between, stay in Lille, it's much cheaper in any of those three. Um, so going on, uh, that's Eurostar that got me to St. Pancras in London, which this uh, station is. And then uh, I continued, uh, went across the street I mean, you can't imagine these things, right? You can't come up with them if you write a book like, you cross the street and you get to the next train station? Why would anyone build something like that, right? So that's King's Cross. And my uh, trip continued along the, uh, along the, the, the coast uh, through beautiful, uh, sorry, beautiful um, uh, skies and, and, and landscapes to Edinburgh. So this is Edinburgh Station and um, that's a picture you've probably seen uh, at, uh, uh, at um, Europe last year. I took it myself. Uh, then uh, after a wonderful week of Europe then I went back to London. This is um, the station Lille again. I stayed there for a night. And then I saw this, uh, Garde List, wonderful place. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, people, if they want to see more pictures, please feel free to um, find Stefan afterward. Um, so, yeah, uh, next talk is up. So, let's welcome our speaker. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I want to talk to you about uh, how you can do hot code reloading in Python while keeping the state of Python. So it's not something you would want to do every day, especially if you were doing web development. There was a talk yesterday on how you can reload the entire app. Because when you're doing web, de web development, typically you don't care about the state. Everything is in the data database. Everything is on the files. But when you're playing with notebooks and you spend two hours loading your data frame, and you're tweaking a library that's in a file on the disk and not in a cell on the notebook, or when you're developing a video game, and you, took, you, you, know, you need to put your character in that position and then you s to see that animation. 
then it's sometimes useful to be able to just reload that code uh, while you are using the app. So I'll show you how to do this. Um, so the first thing you need, uh, so I will take this as an example. There is uh, this, I'm using just the library turtle from Python. And it's just a small turtle, so if you launch it, um, Um, you can just import the turtle paint painter and then you create a turtle. And you can wait for a few steps so it, it's moving around. And I made a bug here, so it's some kind of stuff I, I would like to tweak. Um, and if you look at the source code, it's because it's going backward here. I should have put it forward. So if I want to start reloading this code live, um, what I need to do is first I need to find out where the source code is. And then I need to get that source code and reload it. So there is a very nice library called inspect in Python. So we can import inspect. Um, and then you can use inspect to get the source code of a file. So you can get like the name of the source code of a file. So I have uh, my um, turtle painter and you can, you know, okay, it's in this file. But you can also directly get the source code of the file. And what's interesting is that if you change it um, and you add some uh, something in your code, the next time you call it, you can see that it's, you have the new version. So now, just with this code, we can get the new version of the source code. So the next thing you need to do is a way, so here I will, for example, fix my code. So I make it forward. Then, so I have my source code here. Then I need to, you know, make it to reload it. So first I need to create a new class from that source code. Um, to do that, I can get access to the module using inspect, so inspect module of the turtle painter. And then uh, I can create, a, I need to create a new locals where it, it will store a new value, so uh, just create a new dictionary. And then I can execute the source code in the namespace of that module. So I can just do exec of my source code um, in the module. So I need to get the modules that underscore underscore dict. And with the locals I just spe specified here. And after I did this, I have this dictionary locals that contains the new version, so the new class, uh, and the old one is still active, so my turtle still has the old code. So the last thing I need to do is update the class on my turtle by accessing the underscore underscore class of my turtle e equals locals, and then I can just um, use the name of the turtle painter, that name. And now, um, all that move steps. You can see that my turtle is now going forward. So I just hot changed the code, and the turtle was still running. Everything was still running. It was still keeping the same position. Um, so in synthesis, when you want to do this, this is the main thing you need to do: get the new source code, uh, get the module, create a new uh, local namespace, and then execute the new source code in that local namespace. If you want to go further, there is a library I'll create called Reloader, where you can just use it as, as a decorator. <laughs> Thank you. So, so yeah, uh, because tonight we have the social event, so we will have the last two talks, and then I'm afraid if you don't make it to today, uh, you have to wake up super early tomorrow to sign up. Make sure you are like um, top five or top eight. Yeah, earlier the better. 
uh, this morning, somebody knocked on the door to get in, so yeah. <laughs> so I brought some Windows 7. Ah, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Frederik. I'm an architect, and usually on programming conferences, this raises some uh, confusion, because I'm not an architect for uh, software, but for rather buildings. Um, so, uh, so since I had some chat with some uh, friendly folks here, I thought like, I might share uh, what I do at work. I enjoy as you writing Python. And um, my title in this local office here in Basel is um, I'm so called BIM manager. So, what is BIM? BIM is a, basically a, you can think of your future building as a virtual 3D model with the database in the back. Uh, unfortunately, it's all the big um, proprietary software, but it has an API and that's accessible to Python. So, um, let me show you how this looks like. Um, so this is your virtual building, or rather a little slice of it, um, of a training model uh, where I teach my colleagues some, some basic Python, because um, uh, in this big um, proprietary software, there's lots of terrible workflows. It takes you 20 clicks, which usually could take you like one or two lines of Python. Um, so uh, that, um, to, to demonstrate this, um, I show two tools. One is the Revit Python shell, the REPL, uh, Python REPL inside this um, uh, program, and then PyRevit, uh, how we deploy these little tools that we write for our, co um, our colleagues. Um, so let's take the example of a door. Um, traditionally, uh, this is an element in the building that has a lot of data attached to it. Um, and uh, in large buildings, you usually work with a door consultant. And the first thing that guys want to know is, uh, is it a door that opens to the left or to the right? So the only way for an architect to update this in this model is they would go into the plans and update all these thousands of doors uh, and see whether it's still a lefty or a righty door. Of course, this is a, a stupid robotic task, and they should rather do some creative work. So uh, Python comes to the rescue. This is a super simple yeah, 40 lines of um, Python code. We can test it in the REPL and see how the uh, data is um, uh, updated. And you see within a blink of an eye, uh, it checks all the doors. What is the standard configuration of the door? Has it been um, uh, mirrored? Uh, and uh, when it gets that back from the database, it writes the data back to the door. Uh, so this can save a, a massive amounts of data, but the logic is super simple. Um, of course, you're not only restricted to, the, to this proprietary app. You can also have lots of fun uh, with uh, CLI apps, uh, checking thousands of doors uh, on how they changed and what, what happened to the data. And um, so, conclusion is, if you know some, you have some friends that are architects, uh, maybe you can nudge them to learn some Python, because uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruits there. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so uh, I, won't, I won't continue my story, because it's quite long. And try to find me on a social show event, and I will tell you the rest of the story, because I will be drinking, so the story will be funnier. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, this is our last talk. So uh, also tomorrow morning, uh, I don't know, our volunteer appear at the A15, something like that, to open the door. Not sure. Sorry, eight. Okay, eight thirteen to, to the public. So uh, if you're too early, you may have to wait outside. So yeah, because they are they're working very hard. So yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Hello again. Since this is a lightning talk, this is going to be lightning fast. So I want to invite you all to come to Python Pizza Hamburg on the 9th of November. So here are five reasons why you should come. First, Python is our favorite programming language. And of course, we want to talk about it. Pizza. This one is self-explanatory. Share some pizza with your fellow Pythonistas. Hamburg. Come explore the beautiful city of Hamburg. We have a two-week challenge for submitting a call for proposal. So this is your golden opportunity. And this conference is good for first-time speakers. Last but not least, if all of these reasons didn't manage to convince you, come for the Pi Ladies event co-hosted by Pi Ladies Hamburg and Berlin. Hope to see you there. Woo! Any uh, any any announcements by the organizers or how to go to the uh, Shoujo event? If you're going to the Shoujo event, anybody have any clues? Because I'm I, I try to be local here, but I'm not that local yet. Um, I think there is um I think somebody post uh, I think Martin posts on Telegram. I think it's like number twelve, and then take the S one something like that is the quickest. 
but yeah, double check uh, if, if you can't find on Telegram, maybe uh, ask Google. Um, so yeah, we'll see you at the social event. And then uh, also, if you uh, want to join, you can still uh, pay by cash, and then uh, you can still join our social event. So see you there, and see you tomorrow.